Hello everyone, my name is Zenitsu, and I'm back with another Digimon pre-release guide. This time, I'm taking a look at the brand new up-and-coming set, BT-16, Beginning Observer. So, when it comes to pre-release, the best thing to know is, well, what exactly is a pre-release? So, a pre-release is just a sealed event, which means you're going to walk into your store, pay the participation fee, they're going to hand you six packs, and you're going to build a 40-card deck out of those six packs. Yes, you do get to keep all of the cards that you opened because, well, they're yours. Then, uh, when it comes to uh, actually making uh, the uh, sealed uh, experience a little bit more playable because it's kind of clunky and awkward, and it's still clunky and awkward even with a couple of these rule changes, but at least some of these rule changes do help uh, make the format a little bit more palatable. So the special rules that you're going to have to keep in mind is, well, players can ignore Digivolution color requirements, but they still have to meet the uh, level and cost requirements when Digivolving into your cards. Then, speaking of ignoring Digivolution uh, color requirements, you also could ignore color requirements for DNA Digivolutions, which there are a couple of DNA Digimon in the set. Then, uh, when it comes to uh, colors, Yes, you can ignore Digivolution requirements for colors, but you still have to meet the color requirements when it comes to options and effects. Options, you cannot ignore color requirements unless it says otherwise through a special condition. And then when an effect is asking for a specific color, you also have to abide by that color rule because that's what the card is actually doing. So when it comes to events, one of the biggest appeal to always playing in Digimon events is the prizing, and the prizing this time around is actually pretty decent. So just for participating, you're going to be getting a promo Vmon. Then you're also going to be getting a pre-release pack, which will contain two cards. One of them will be a stamped foil uncommon from the set, and the other will be a foil stamped rare, just to try to help buffer things out. Then when it comes to what you're actually going to be getting for winning the event, we get a uh, nice uh, reprint of the promo Ukamon. Then stores might add some additional pricing, like extra packs or promos, but that's purely based on the store. So when looking at the set, uh, there's a couple of things that you should be focused on so that way you don't necessarily study cards, synergies, and interactions that you're not necessarily going to be seeing very often. So when it comes to looking at a set, I always try to prioritize uh, studying the rares and below because that's what you're going to be seeing more often. So uh, understanding how a box works also will help determine the odds of getting a specific card. So ultimately, you could try to evaluate uh, what you're more likely to see and play with as a result. So in a normal booster box, uh, the pull rates uh, we know of are going to be an average of 7 SRs and 2 hits per box, a hit either being a secret rare or an alt art. Then in a booster box, uh, understanding the pull rates of the low rarities also will help determine uh, what cards you're more likely to see. So in any given booster box, you're usually going to see 3 to 4 of any given common, 2 to 3 of any given uncommon, and 1 to 2 of any given rare. So again, that's out of a booster box setting, and I believe a booster box is good for a total of 4 people. So you could use this information to assess what you're most likely to see. When it comes to BT-16, well, we're back to a normal set. So what I mean by this is BT-15 was an exception because it did have the LM cards added into it, and, well, BT-16 has nothing funky going on in it whatsoever, and we're back to the normal booster box pull ratios and size that we're used to. So this is all fine and dandy, but when it comes to actually playing in pre-release outside of the act of playing, deck building is going to be a huge important aspect of the game. So uh, remember that you're going to only be playing a 40 card deck and you're going to be playing with the cards that you pulled and all of the other cards that you pulled are going to be your sideboard. Then uh, when it comes to uh, what a good ratio for building your deck is with 40 cards, this is just a simple base that I use. Again, depending on what your pulls look like, the ratios are going to have to vary. Not everything is going to be the same, but this is just what I personally generally shoot for. 
So when it actually comes to analyzing your cards and figuring out what you should prioritize, I use an acronym that came from Magic the Gathering called BRAD. So uh, all of the cards are going to fall into one of these categories, and usually uh, when a card falls into multiple categories, the more categories it falls into is usually the stronger card. But when it comes to uh, breaking down bread, we have uh, five elements of it. We have B, the bombs, R, removal, E, evasion, A, aggro, and D, duds. So bombs are usually going to be your win condition. These are your cards in Digimon that have the most and highest amount of impact when you use them. Most of the time, it's going to be on your higher level Digimon. Then removal is pretty self-explanatory. These are effects that can remove problematic cards from the field. They're not exclusively two options and Digimon can do them as well. So uh, there's two different types of removal that the game has to play with. There's hard removal and soft removal. So uh, hard removal are going to be effects that remove the body outright. So these are going to be abilities like a deletion, bouncing to hand, putting to the bottom of the deck, DP reducing to zero, and obviously attacking into them. And then soft removal are going to be ways that are going to uh, not necessarily remove the Digimon, but stop it from being useful, like D-Digivolve to uh, get rid of a certain stage or state of the Digimon and stun locking them so that way they can't unsuspend or suspend, limiting what that card can even do. Evasion are your defensive cards. It's usually good to pair up some offense with some defense and knowing what are your defensive capabilities and how to play them will be to your overall benefit. So uh, defensive mechanics in the game are just ways to stave off damage, uh, like blocker and security attack minus. And then we also do have uh, cards with some protection. So again, it's trying to slow down what the opponent can do and how they could get rid of your cards. So these are going to be effects like armor purge, reboot, evade, barrier, all things that just make the uh, Digimon harder to deal with uh, for the opponent. And then uh, when it comes to aggro, uh, like bombs being mostly on the top end, your aggro cards are mostly going to be on the low end. So uh, when it comes to evaluating what an aggressive card is, there's a couple of different factors that, that go into it. The biggest one being how effective the card is to use. Because if you're trying to build up into one stack and then that stack swings once and only deals maybe one to two damage versus using that same amount of memory to be playing two to three bodies, well, it's sometimes easier to uh, pick the latter than the former so that way you can try to win as quickly as you possibly can, especially if the opponent doesn't have good defensive options uh, set up. And then duds are exactly what they say, duds. These are cards you're usually never going to want to use and prioritize because if you can avoid it, it's better to avoid it because these cards are going to be harder to use or their effects basically completely useless depending on what the card is asking for. Then when it comes to Digitamas, it's cool to see that all the Digitamas this time around are useful. Some are going to be a little bit more useful than others, and I separated them into three categories. So the most useful Digitamas are going to be blue, uh, red, yellow, and green, because there's a lot of two-color Digimon in this set, and all of them have effects that trigger with two-color Digimon. Then purple is an okay card to use. It's not bad, obviously, if you don't have any other options, you're kind of forced to use it. But in terms of what its ability is doing, it's just a generic card, which is not always a bad thing. Where black seems like it's going to be the worst of the Digitamas because its ability isn't bad. It just requires specific effects in order to make useful. And if you don't have the ability to trigger it, then the egg really isn't doing anything outside of being a vanilla egg. Then when it comes to the tamers, I kind of did the same thing and I separated the tamers into two different categories. One set of tamers is going to have actual effects that you can try to utilize on top of just being generic memory fixing tamers. So at worst, it's always setting you to three, preventing you from being memory choked. But uh, with uh, Hacker Judge and uh, Kosuke, 
they actually have some decent mind link abilities that we could use to try to actually uh, further push what the set is allowing us to do in a pre-release setting where Louis is mostly just going to be a generic vanilla just to use uh, for a memory fixing tamer if you're going to use it. So it's not like I'm saying the other tamers are bad per se. They do have their own more niche uses, but again, those are more niche uses. And the best thing about them is the fact that they're two colors. So that way you could try to utilize options a little bit easier for the most part. It again, all just depends on the pool that you're playing with. Then with the, the set specifically, there are a couple of things that you should generally keep in mind. So there are actually Ace Digimon on the lower rarities. So uh, Ace Digimon are uh, Digimon that can Digivolve on the opponent's turn for free if you're attacking. And uh, they're going to have a really profound impact on this type of a format because of just how good having an ace can be at not only just uh, evolving more efficiently than the opponent, but potentially disrupting and controlling the opponent, putting them at a deficit. So you're going to want to look out for Ace Digimon and to understand where the Ace Digimon are. Spoiler alert, they're mostly on the Mega Level Digimon. But uh, when it comes to other things about the set more specifically, there is just a lot of two-color Digimon. So uh, when it comes to two-color Digimon, usually they do have a higher evolution cost, but they do have a way to uh, make themselves a little bit cheaper with a name-based evolution. So if you could line up those name-based evolutions to make the card cheaper, great, the card is fantastic. But otherwise, sometimes the generic cards are going to be a little bit more beneficial to use just because the stats and abilities that you could use are going to be easier to play with. And that's what makes uh, generic cards... Uh, one of the better cards to try to prioritize, especially in this set, because there is a lot of cards asking for other specific cards and synergies in order to be as useful as possible. Having cards that just don't need any of that is for your overall benefit when it comes to uh, trying to get the most value out of what your cards are doing. Sure, the ceiling isn't necessarily as high, but if you could beat out what the opponent is doing, then it kind of just doesn't matter. So when it comes to some of the specific synergies in the set more specifically, there are a good amount of cross synergies uh, with a couple of traits and names that you're going to want to look out for, which is going to be the free trait, the pulse mod name, the SOC trait, and the X antibody trait as a couple of standouts. Then when it comes to how the meta is overall going to probably develop, usually in pre-releases there's two main metas that are going to be present. One is going to be a Rookie Rush aggro style meta, and the other is going to be a stack-based tempo and value meta. So I think that this set, based on how things are going to be lining up, it could kind of go either way. There's enough defensive options where I don't necessarily think Rookie Rush is going to be the way, especially since there's not a whole lot of hyper-efficient cards, especially on the lower level. But uh, because of Armor Purge, it definitely can kind of lean that way, where you could get a lot of value because of Armor Purge. But I do think that the majority of what this meta and how a lot of people are going to be playing it is going to be that stack in value base. So that way you're going to want to try to prioritize Digivolving your Digimon into one big Digimon and to try to dominate the field with that one big Digimon to make it easier to win over the opponent. And then when it comes to just some other general tips, you're going to want to make sure you're as physically prepared as possible. So make sure to bring some water, snacks, and the proper supplies to play with. Then this is just a more casual environment, so relax and just have fun with it. It's not anything to take super seriously because the game doesn't take this format very seriously, so why should you? This is just a good way to get some product early and introduce you to the set so you can be prepared for when BT16 actually releases. But uh, when it comes to uh, trying to be a little bit on the more competitive side, there's just a couple of general tips that I generally like to ask myself when it comes to the deck building process. Like, what does my card pool look like? What is my actual win con? What are the synergies uh, that I'm going to be playing with, uh, whether it's cross color and cross archetype synergies that are going to support the win con I'm planning? And what cards should I be using? But... I hope all of this is as informative as possible to make sure that you are prepared for your own pre-release events.